We really need to do all that we can to understand our soil, to nurture those biological, physical and chemical attributes in the soil. So when I talk about the biological attributes, I'm talking about that vibrant community of organisms that are full of life and full of activity. And we're so lucky to have Dr. Helen Hayden online today talking to us after a little bit about soil biology. Uh, we've got that physical component of soil, which is the makeup of the soil. It's that structural support and creating that home for where the water and the air can exist in the soil that our plants and our organisms need to grow and survive. And then we've got that chemical attribute of the soil, which is what we're going to talk a lot about today um, in my presentation, which is the minerals, those macro micronutrients that are required for the plants and organisms to survive. Basically, soil is the lifeblood blood of our farms and that's why it's important. So why would we want to be soil testing? So I guess one of the number one reasons why we might want to do soil testing is for plant agronomic reasons. We want to grow strong pastures and crops and we want to ensure that we've got enough nutrients to make that happen. So in terms of those nutrients, what are some of those main important nutrients? We've got our nitrogen. It's important for photosynthesis and plant growth. We've got our phosphorus, uh, important in, you know, also plant growth and the, the blooming of the, the plants and the, the roots. We've got our potassium, which helps build the proteins in the structure and the, the quality of the products and the helping the plants actually and soil fight off disease. We've got calcium, which is essential in the plant cell wall development. We've got our magnesium, which helps activate the enzymes and really important in chlorophyll, which is the green stuff that helps the photosynthesis. We've got our sulfur, which is essential for um, proteins and enzymes as well. And then we've got our trace elements, our micronutrients, so iron, manganese, copper, zinc, boron, fluoride and molybdenum. And these are essential for a right, wide range of functions. So, you know, we, we soil test because we want to understand what those are in our soil, but there's also some other reasons why we might be wanting to soil test. And I guess that's why you guys are here. You're thinking about, you know, why, why would you want to soil test your land and how can we do that? So some other reasons are you want to establish a baseline soil nutrient status across your farm. You want to understand what do you have? Or you've, got, you've purchased some new paddocks and you, you understand what's on your property, but you might want to understand what's, what's the status of those new paddocks. You might be wanting to measure change in soil nutrient status over time um, or the effectiveness of a management practice. You might be looking at doing some composting or you know, changing something on, on the farm. And actually, how effective is that? So if we can get an understanding before and after, we can understand um, how our soils are changing and improving. It might be about investigating a problem or an issue on the farm or a paddock. It might be about um, understanding differences across the farm. So there might be some red soil and black soil. You might be hills, hills and your slopes, or you've got your really good areas and your poor areas, and you want to understand, well, why are they different? Um, it might actually be for uh, certification requirements. So you might be wanting to apply biosolids or, um, you know, organic status or carbon credits or whatever that might be, and you might actually need to get some kind of certification saying what you have on your property. Um, and part of that, I guess, is uh, of also avoiding that we don't um, give excess nutrients to our, our plants um, and we don't have the accumulation of the, the soluble salts that we don't want in our soils. Uh, it might be that you want to develop a plan for some variable rate application of fertilisers on the profit property or it might be as simple as something like you just want to understand what the pH is across the property or a paddock and is there a need for liming. So there's lots of reasons why we might be soil sampling. Um, a lot of the soil sampling that we talk about and uh, do is, is the 0 to 10, the top soil sampling, but I just wanted to touch on why we might want to sample deeper than that. Um, we might want to be looking at, you know, is there nitrogen, sulphur and water deeper in the soil profile? We might want to see if there's any um, layers of nutrients that are, are there that we don't know about that um, aren't mobile in the soil uh, so that we could do change some practices to uh, access those nutrients. 
It might be about seeing if there's any subsoil constraints or toxicities. You know, do we have sodicity? Is there boron issues? Is there subsoil acidity or alkalinity? It might be about just getting a better understanding of physical characteristics. So what's some of our potential water holding capacity or what, what about the texture of our soil deeper? Might be about um, establishing affecting effective root growth as well or just in general the size of the nutrient bucket. So how deep are those nutrients sitting in the soil? Or it might be about wanting to establish a deeper rooted species. So you might be wanting to establish a lucerne paddock um, or some other deeper rooted plants and then you know they might not be growing well and you just want to investigate why that is. Okay, so we know that why we want to be sampling. Well, when should we be doing this sampling? So I guess there's there's a few different reasons and one of those times might be you're wanting to make management decisions during a season or just getting general um, soil investigation or establishing a farm baseline. So for that kind of soil sampling, the best time is active growing season where there's a high demand of soil nutrients for the plants, um, which tends to be for us in our area, so late winter to early spring where there's consistent soil moisture. So essentially now, and that's why we've got this webinar today because um, it's a great time to get out in the paddock and take some soil samples. But we also want to make sure it's not too wet as well. So what about if we want to make management decisions before the season starts? So in a cropping situation, it might be you want to um, take your soil sample immediately prior to planting a crop. That's around the March, April time when that seed bed is as close to final preparation it's going to be, that nutrient status is as close to what there's going to be when the crop starts growing so you want to understand what's going on. Or it might actually be you've, you've got a new paddock and you want to establish a pasture in there. You're converting it from whatever it was into pasture and you want to get an understanding of what's there. So with establishing a pasture, it's a really good idea to take the soil samples um, a couple of years before the pasture is going to be sown. If you've got that luxury of that foresight, just so that there's time for if you're going to be addressing any soil deficiencies that you can correct those. Um, uh, some other important things to note are if the soil sampling is uh, post fertilizer or lime application, you want to wait at least six weeks for that to be incorporated and not mess up the results. As well as we want to allow about two working weeks for the samples to be tested and returned from the laboratory so we can actually get our soil testing results. So how frequently should we be soil testing? So I guess this is not the answer we want to hear, but it's really up to you, the farm size that you have, the plans for the farm and the activity that's happening. But I guess as a guide for dynamic tests such as uh, the phosphorus and nitrogen things that are changing, um, that we have influence over, that, that's something that you know every three to five years. Or there's the slow changing characteristics such as pH or organic carbon that might be less frequently, so something like every 10 years. And rotating testing around the paddocks of a farm is really good as well to get an understanding. So we know the why, the when, but now we want to know the how. So this is a, a soil testing as a service that local agronomists and advisors can help with. Um, they can also help with um, the physical sampling and also the paddock selection. But it's something that you can do yourself or a landowner can do on the property, especially now considering, um, like I said at the start of the meeting, we've all got this extra time on our hands, haven't we? So it is something that can happen, um, yeah, that you can do yourself. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes explaining how we can actually do that soil sampling. So where do we start? It can be pretty confusing. There's lots of questions, but let's try and think about, you know, why do I want to test my soil and what is it that I want to learn? This can really help guide the soil testing uh, sampling process that we go through plus the sample, the tests that we actually ask for from the lab. There's no single rule for determining which areas should be sampled though, however, because that's about thinking about what are the questions that we want answered. Is it a baseline nutrient status that we want to get across the whole farm? Are we wanting to set up a fertilizer program? Uh, do we have a problem paddock? Is there just that one paddock that just won't produce the same as everywhere else that we really want to investigate? Is it that, like we said earlier, is it that pH, that, that nutrients or the heavy metals that we want to understand? 
So if it's that kind of baseline understanding across our farm or we're wanting to set up a fertiliser program, it can be best to sample every paddock on the property. Now that can be both time consuming and quite costly to do. But an alternative strategy to, to doing that is that we can sample a set portion of our farm annually. For example, you know, if we put aside sampling 20% of the farm each year, then in subsequent years, we can sample the different paddocks and um, combine those results to get a good profile of the property. But okay, what if we, you know, we've got some soil tests, but it's not about getting an understanding of the whole farm. What if we just want to get some differences across the farm? This is a good alternative if you can't sample the whole farm. It's about selecting paddocks or sections of paddocks that represent those uh, major range of conditions that you have. For example, you know, you could sample on your good pasture and your poor pasture. You could sample the paddocks that have a high stocking rate or a low stocking rate. You could sample your flats and then your slopes, your black soils or your red soils, your sandy soils and your clays, or it might be your granites and then your basalts. So that's to get a bit of an understanding about the differences across farm. What about if it's that specific paddock that you've got or that problem that you want to address? Well, if you know which paddock you want to investigate, then select that one. That's a pretty easy one. And you can tr contrast that by taking a sample from a non-problem area as well. We don't just want to sample that one paddock that doesn't produce anything for us or is really tricky or whatever it is that we want to understand. We want to also compare that to something. So you want to make sure you're pairing it with something else. Uh, we might be wanting to um, understand the change over time. So therefore you want to be resampling paddocks that you've already sampled so that you can get an understanding about those management practices or how soil fertility might be changing. So what are some, some helpful tips about where we can select on the property? So we want to make sure it's as uniform as possible where we're going to be taking that sample from and sending off to the lab in terms of the soil type and the fertiliser history. For practical purposes, it really should be an area that we expect to fertilise or manage as a unit. So if, you know, half of your farm is managed by one farming uh, management practice or fertiliser regime, then getting one sample from there, um, if you're not wanting to do the whole farm, can be adequate. But yeah, really, really important to make sure it's sampling how we're going to be treating um, those paddocks as well. So when we're, when we're thinking about, okay, we're going to select our paddock, but where do we not want to sample in that paddock? So we want to make sure that we're not sampling at the top or the bottom of a slope because that has significant impact on the, the characteristics and um, isn't as uniform across the, the paddock. We want to avoid the unusual areas. So we, we don't want to sample where we've spilt some fertiliser or lime or had the compost pile uh, sitting because we know that those results, results are going to be different. We want to stay away from the fence lines, the gates, the, the camping areas where the stock are going to be camping or where those water troughs are. And we definitely don't want to have urine patches and we've got the image to the right that we can see, you know, you might have your paddock selected and you've got a gully. You want to avoid the gully as well because it's just such a small proportion of how that um, paddock um, functions. So in terms of the fence lines, it's best not to sample within 10 metres of the fence lines, those gates, those troughs or those trees. So printing out a um, farm map and then Drawing, drawing the where you don't want to sample and drawing those lines can be really helpful to get a good understanding of the farm. And so it's really important as well, once we've selected where we're going to be taking the soil sample from, that we want to mark down where that sample's taken from for future reference. So however you note um, your records, just making a record of where we've actually taken those soil samples from and what paddock we're selecting. So what do you actually need when you're soil sampling? So, um, you know, if I had all my equipment with me, um, we have uh, soil corers and augers that we can use, which usually go to the depth of uh, 10 centimetres. But we don't necessarily, um, everyone doesn't have access to a corer. So a simple spade can be used. So we can dig a V into the soil. And this is another reason why this time of year is great is because, you know, hopefully our soils have enough moisture in there that this isn't too tricky. So we dig that V, we remove, 
we remove that top soil um, patch and then we take a thin slice out of the soil from the side. So kind of like cutting a slice of cake um, and that's, that's that sample that we want to keep. So it's important that we are sampling the top 10 centimetres. We don't want to be sampling shallower than that because there can be higher nutrients. Um, we'll get a higher nutrient uh, reading than is actually available for the growing plant. Um, we want to place the cores when we take them between um, chunks of uh, pasture green matter, we want to remove that from the sample because as we know the the green stuff is full of nutrients uh, that aren't necessarily in the soil either so we just want to remove those. And to obtain a representative sample um, what we need to do is we, we actually just can't get away of taking digging one little hole and taking a slice from that. We need to combine from a large area and a large number of places within the sample area or the paddock that you've decided and the more cores that we combine the more resent representative um, that final sample will be and the better advice we can actually have. And so I guess the going advice that we have is to take at least 20 to 30 cores for that sample. So my, why might we need to take those? So I put up an image here which is from the McAllister Research Farm and uh, what, what this represents, this is um, Olsen p-values from a paddock and it just indicates the highly variable um, nutrient status that we can see across a paddock. So if, if we're going to treat this paddock the same, this, this paddock is going to be fertilised or managed the same. Um, we're not going to be able to actually manage each little individual spot there um, individually. So we want to get, a, I guess, that average, that representative number. So if we took a sample near the gate, you know, we can see we've got 40, 30, 24, 19, we're going to get a much higher reading than if we take it, you know, below the trough where we've got 9, 9, 8 and 9. So that's why we, we want to composite and take as many samples as we can so that we can get rid of that variation um, and, and get a best representative sample. So, okay, so how do we actually sample those paddocks? And once we've chosen where on the farm that we want to sample, we need to decide how that we're actually going to be doing that. So in terms of paddocks um, that are less than 20 hectares or 50 acres, we want to take those cores, as we said earlier, from 20 to 30 sites evenly across the paddock. So if it's a regular shaped paddock, that's as simple as just moving around the paddock and taking those cores. If it's a bit of an irregular shaped paddock, we want to make sure, as we mentioned earlier, that we um, avoid avoid the gullies, avoid the, the things that are not going to be representative and make sure that we sample both the, both the different parts of those irregular shaped paddocks. So what about if we've got um, larger areas that we want to sample, if they're more than the 20 hectares or the 50 acres? If they're a regular shaped paddock, um, what we can do is we can take cores from at least 20 to 30 sites evenly spaced across um, the paddock in a straight line. So um, we can find a point in the paddock and then just walk in a straight line and take samples every couple of me every, you know, might be 10 metres to take a sample as we move across to make sure that it's representative. And, you know, it's, it, if we want to um, do that same transect in the paddock in the future, it can be important to, to mark those, those fence posts or whatever you've used to guide that walking across the paddock. Um, you can also pick four points that might be the corners of a paddock or it might be trees or whatever it is you're going to look at and you can randomly zigzag across the paddock. That's also another way of getting um, a representative sample of those larger paddocks. So what about um, paddocks that are irregular shapes that we don't want to break up? So um, we've got a paddock that we want to, it has some black soil and grey soil, but we actually manage it the same. So how do we, how do we do that? So we're going to pick a reference point, so a landmark such as a tree or fence corner, um, and then we walk towards that and we do that for the other um, the other parts of the paddock too. So as we can see, um, we've got some green dots on that um, image that we saw earlier and that's where we're going to take our soil cores um, for our sample in that paddock. So um, one of my colleagues, Greg Becker, 
put together a soil sampling um, video and I don't have time to show it today but it's a fantastic little video and um, that Jason's going to send through a link of resources after the after these webinars um, and yeah I highly encourage you to watch the it's about three and a half minutes and Greg basically talks about everything that we're talking about today with some really really good tips and tricks so I'm really thankful to Greg who's put that video together on YouTube. So what I talked about earlier was the 0 to 10 subsoil sampling but what about if we want to do some subsoil sampling so um, like like the top top soil the 0 to 10 we want to do a composite so um, it is it's it's harder doing the getting the subsoil so um, and the subsoils are less variable across the paddock so we can reduce the 20 to 30 sample sites to about 15. Um, it's best to have two subsoil depths sampled so we um, if we have a clay layer that's that varies across the across the um, soil that we want to take a subsoil surface sample um, above the the clay layer and then another one in the clay layer where the soil is more consistently increasing with clay then we can do say um, a 10 to 20 centimeter and then a 30 to 45 centimeter sample um, and it's important to be careful to not contaminate them with the topsoil if we are taking the subsoil samples so what do we do next so we've got we've taken our soil cores uh, we've got our 30 20 to 30 samples across the the paddock but you've usually got a lot more than you need so we need to get that big bucket that we have of soil down to about two to three hundred um, grams so to do that we need to subsample so we place those cores together we mix them we break them up we remove the rocks and the debris and the clods and the visible um, grass we then spread the total sample evenly on a clean bench or tarp or whatever it is even if it's a big tray and then it's you, you once you've mixed it all you divide it into the four quarters you then discard two of those diagonal quarters um, place the remaining sample together in a clean container and if you still have more than two to three hundred grams of sample you can do it again it's actually quite fun and it's a good way of making sure we've really mixed up those samples that we have because the more input we put in the better output we get for our results so we transfer that soil to a, a bag a sandwich bag usually works pretty well we seal it we mark on the bag um, where we've taken the sample from so the paddock or the section name the number of cores that are in that that sample and the depth of that so we want to fill out the paperwork that's required for the soil lab where we're going to send the samples and then we want to send them within about 20 to 40, 24 to 48 hours after we've got those samples collected some labs may ask for air dry samples which is is um, yeah just check what the lab wants in that regard so we've got our samples and we're ready for dispatch to the laboratory but before I continue I just want to rewind back to the start so We've got our sample and we've done all that work but we need somewhere to send it so the selection of a soil lab um, that you've chosen is something sh that should be one of the first things that is done um, this is because there the where you send the soil sample to might provide some guidance on the sampling requirements they might have more information um, for you and that will provide the sheets and tell you everything that you need to fill out and send that through and it's really important to fill out those sheets thoroughly and that makes sure that we've got the best possible recommendations and analysis that can be made on that sample so we've we'll fast forward now back back after we've rewind how do we actually know which lab to use so it's one of the first things that we need to do but what about what are the differences in the labs where do we actually send these samples to so one thing that's really important is it's important to use the same lab for consistency of results so that we can show trends and that's because every lab is slightly different they're going to have different scientists using um, similar methods 
but um, slightly different ways. So it's really important to make sure that it's um, consistent. And as I mentioned, there's lots and lots of different labs. So how can you narrow that down? So chat to your neighbour or your local agronomist or agricultural stores, and they, they may have a really good suggestion of a lab that they've used that's um, reliable and has um, they've found a really good process. Um, another way is you can do a Google search such as Soil Labs Victoria Grazing, if you're after grazing, or Soil Labs Victoria Cropping, or Orchards, or whatever it is. And um, you're not bound to using Victorian Labs, but um, the recommendations that you'll get from the results, um, often the different labs will have different um, testing that they've done in those areas. So a Victorian lab, you know, we can assume has done a lot of the testing to understand their results in Victoria. Um, and as well, there's different tests for grazing and cropping and that's why you just want to make sure that the lab that you're sending it to um, can cater for the farming enterprise that you have and the land use that those paddocks are actually coming from. It's really important to check that the, the labs have some accreditation. Um, and there's two different types of accredit accreditation. There's the ASPAC accreditation or the NATA. And what this means is that the results are reliable. It's not someone just saying, uh, just doing whatever practice they want to to determine a result and telling you something. There's actually a process that these labs are following to get those results. So there's the ASPAC, which is the Australasian Soil and Plant Analysis Council, and then there's the NATA. So these two symbols are really important to look for and after you've done your Google search or you've had your chat to your local ag store or agronomist, really easy um, to find this information out. You can ask them um, and you can you can see that they've got this accreditation and then you can have some confidence in knowing that your results are reliable. Um, interesting of note, some labs also do compost and manure sampling um, and it's important to take a subsample from the product um, if you're going to use that. Um, but also, if you're going to be buy, buying a compost or manure or any of those products, you're well in your right to ask for an analysis of those. So um, that should be provided to you. But if it's a compost you're making on your property and you want to understand what the nutrient status is of those, some labs will do tests for those as well. What things should I actually ask for in my soil tests? So there's simple and there's comprehensive tests. And that means that there's a range of costings from about $50 to $150 per sample. Um, and that's just a guide. And that really depends on what you're asking for. So as I mentioned earlier, it's important to get the right test for the right paddock use. Because some tests are better for cropping soils, some are better for pasture soils, some are better for grape production soil, some are better for orchards, and so it's important to make sure that the lab um, is doing the right tests for that. So if we're getting a first soil test, um, it's important to make sure um, that that's a comprehensive one. Um, subsequent tests maybe don't need the full comprehensive soil test analysis, but for that first one it's quite important too. Um, and it's also important when we're thinking about what we want to know from those soil tests to remember to ask yourself, why do we actually want to get the soil test in the first place? If it is just that you want to understand your pH, that's all you need to ask for. If it is that you just want to understand your heavy metal status, that's what you need to ask for. But in terms of a comprehensive uh, soil test, say for example for our pasture, we've got our Olsen and our Colwell phosphorus tests, we've got our um, PBI, which is our buffer index, we've got our potassium, our sulphur, uh, we've got a pH, we've got our exchangeable aluminium, electri electrical conductivity, so our, I guess, measure of salinity, um, chloride, our nitrogens, ammonium and nitrate, organic carbons, exchangeable cations, um, and texture and soil colour. So these are all the things that can be included in a comprehensive soil test. So what about for cropping? So I've highlighted some differences there. We can see that if, if we're getting a comprehensive soil test for pasture compared to cropping, they can actually be quite different things that we're asking for. So that's just important to note. Um, and just pointing out, for example, so why are they different? So we've got the Olsen P measure of how they actually do that soil test, and that's really good for pasture. So that's been um, lots and lots of research has been put into that really good 
phosphorus curves. And so that test and that number can be a good understanding for a pasture. But that, that isn't the same for cropping. The Olsen P doesn't really um, help ex explain the, the phosphorus level in a, um, a cropping situation, but the Colwell me measure of getting phosphorus is. Um, but something important to note, if you're going to get a Colwell P, then you also need to get a phosphorus buffering index. And some of this might be a little bit um, a little bit too confusing, but we will be doing a soil test interpretation workshop coming up, so all of that will be explained in there. So what else could I ask for in my soil test? So those are the things that are kind of in normal comprehensive soil tests, but there's other things that we can ask for as well. So we can ask for heavy metals, more soil physical tests. We can ask for total nitrogen, total carbon. Um, that includes all the different forms of carbon and nitrogen that will be available over, over time, just not the immediately ones available. You can ask for other trace elements. But what about soil biology? Is that something that we can ask for in our conventional um, chemical testing? Um, the answer to that is no. <laughs> and luckily we've got Helen online to talk about that um, in much more detail coming up. So we're very thankful for that. So what else can I ask for in my soil test? What about those deeper subsoils? So some labs do offer specific subsoil testing packages, um, but also it's if we're taking soil subsoil samples and we want to get that tested, it's important to think about what constraints we might be looking for. So we might ask for exchangeable cations on that sample to understand sodicity. We might just want to get pH if we think there's acidity, um, electrical conductivity for salinity issues. We might want to get a better understanding of the physical constraints that might be in the soil. So we can ask for texture and colour. Um, we can ask for uh, boron or aluminium levels deeper in the subsoil to understand if there's any toxicities. Or we might want to get an understanding of some of that deeper um, nitrogens. Or nutrient status, so we can ask for that, or we can ask for moisture as well. So we've got our soil tests, we've sent them away, and then a few couple of weeks later, we get our results back. So what what do we do with those? So some labs will actually provide an interpretation with critical values or recommendations that come from those tests. Um, this is something that you can talk about with your uh, agronomist or your advisor or a neighbour or anyone really um, that you're working with to get an understanding of what those are. There's lots of fantastic online resources as well. So there's that how to take a soil sample YouTube, there's the understanding your soil test um, book and that's what we can see on the right. That's a really, really good resource and um, there's uh, understanding your soil test for pastures, that's on the Agriculture Victoria website. Um, but this is where I'm going to promote and pump that there will be a webinar in October or November that we're going to be talking about soil test interpretation. So um, thanks everyone for going with me on that journey about, you know, the who, what, when, where, why of soil sampling. Um, and yes, I will pass back over to Jason um, now. And thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, Beck. Um, we will just, there is a couple of questions and while anyone has got any questions, I'll just hand over the microphone to Hugh. Hugh, if uh, I am unmuting and un, hopefully, you, yeah, you, you, you've got the floor. Yeah, can you hear me, Jason? Idea. Yep, yep. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name's Hugh Thompson. I'm the new Rural Lands Officer for Melbourne Water. Um, and for nearly 10 years, Melbourne Water, through the Rural Land Program, have supported programs that have worked with hundreds of landholders in the upper Maribyrnong catchment. The Rural Land Program assists landholders and community groups with technical and financial assistance, including sessions on whole farm planning, field days, farm walks, and speakers on best practice management. The Rural Land Program has also assisted over 70 landholders in the Emu Creek, Boyd Creek and Deep Creek upper subcatchments, which are our priority areas. We have funded on-ground works including riparian fencing, revegetation, weed control programs, dam decommissioning and the establishment of off stream watering points on a dollar for dollar basis. We achieve our goals of reducing the amount of sediment and nutrient entering the waterway and hopefully you have a more productive and profitable farm by retaining soil and nutrients a more valuable property from completing the works program as well. If you're interested in participating in the Rural Land Program, 
I'll answer my phone number and email in the chat, or otherwise give Jason a call and uh, look forward to working together. Thanks, Jason. Good on you, Hugh. Thanks for that. You've read it beautifully. Well done. Um, yeah, so I've only got a couple of questions, um, Rebecca, through the chat as we went through. Um, so uh, let's have a look at those. So right at the start, there was a question from Mark W. Where where is carbon in the list, and is it involved? Is it involved in others? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, yeah, I think that's in to. reference to uh, when I went through the list of the. Um, the macro and micronutrients. So uh, yes, it, that's carbon is very important, and um, I was just chatting there about some of those macro and micronutrients. But hopefully that was addressed when we talked about the different soil um, tests that can be asked for. So carbon is very important and definitely something that we should be getting um, tested when we are getting our soil samples done. And um, Helen is going to to touch on. The, um, the carbon and the upcoming webinars as well will be touching on that. So um, hopefully that yeah, answered your own question as we went through the presentation. So that uh, separate is, one, or oh, sorry. Yep, yep, go to the uh, next one. If we haven't asked, answered your question, Mark, just, just and John and, and Maddie as we go through, just type in the chat and we'll, we'll try and attempt to go answer, answer those questions. Yeah, and so I guess um, yeah, that's that's an important one in terms of the independence and interpretation of the results. So, I guess one of you know my first hopes is that as landholders, that people can feel equipped to uh, read a soil test themselves and understand that. So that's part of um, that next webinar that we'll be running, which will be going through. Okay, I talked about all those macro and micronutrients. I talked about all those things. I also mentioned there's phosphorus and there's lots of different soil tests for phosphorus. What do that actually mean? And what are the, some of the things I should be looking at on those soil tests? So um, that's definitely somewhere, that that's as independent as you can get, is upskilling yourself in that. Um, and that's why that um, that resource, that um, soil test, understanding of soil test, soil test, soil test interpretation that was created by the Golden Broken CMA is a really fantastic resource Resource because it goes through all of those um, different important um, soil things, soil tests and what some of those values are and why um, they are important. And I think someone commented in in the, um, the list as well that they had a recommendation of an independent agronomist and yeah, there's lots out there and just chat around. I think there's lots of fantastic agronomists and advisors that will be able to um, to talk to you about those soil test results and to give you an understanding about what they actually mean. So hopefully that's answered that. Um, in terms of uh, the relationship between soil chemistry and weeds, so um, that's definitely not an area of my expertise and hopefully something that Helen might be able to touch on a little bit in terms of um, the the soil biology part of that question. Um, so I don't know if, if, yeah, that's something that I can take offline and um, uh, try and answer for you in time to come. But yeah, so thanks everyone and I did put my details up and Jason will send those through um, if you do have further questions. Yeah, so there's another question there in the chat. Um, does yep. Ag Vic have a relationship with regener regenerate groups? Uh, so in terms of um, in terms of that, I'm not 100% uh, aware of all the different um, groups. I know there's a lot of regeneration ag groups out there, um, and in terms of like our relationship with those, is that uh, I my job. I'm pretty lucky. I get to talk to to whoever wants to hear about soil, I'm happy to come along and present about soil. So whether it's um, soil health, um, and Jason will talk about that coming up, that will be a practical workshop that we'll run uh, probably next year now, um, and things like this. So uh, in terms of if there's groups out there, 
um, in terms of the Regeneration Ag or that Regenerate Ag group, um, the relationship would be that, you know, we can have presenters come along and work with those groups. Uh, we do work closely with the North Central CMA and they have um, different programs and different groups as well. And similarly, um, coming along, presenting um, to those groups and sharing our knowledge and insights about soil. Okay, that looks like it. So we'll now hand it over to Helen um, and Helen will go through her, um, her presentation. Over to you, Helen. Okay, can everyone hear me okay for a start? Just let me know or let Jason know in the chat if you can hear me. All good, all good. I can and hear you. This okay. So, um, so I, we're going to have a short refresher on soil biology because it's quite important to picture for soil biology before you choose a soil biology test. And one thing that's really good between my talk and Bex is that how I sample soil is exactly the way that Beck just explained it to you. So um, whatever test you do choose, if you're interested in soil biology testing, you should check what guidance lab offers. But the way that I do my soil biology testing is the exact way that Beck just explained hers. So a bit about me, um, I'm not an extension person, I'm a researcher. So I'm happiest when the experiments that I've done on people's farms. And generally, I do a lot of DNA and RNA work. So I do sequencing of soil mostly. But I do also do extension because um, I see it as a two-way street. You can learn from me, but I also learn a hell of a lot from you. So um, as an overview, I'm going to talk about who lives in your soil, what are the functions of those organisms, what are some of the tests available for soil biology, and what you can do yourself on farm. So here's the visual picture of all in your soil to kind of get us starting to think about them for this component of the talk. And the reason that it's a triangle is that generally the bigger organisms are in soil, the less abundant they are. And the key thing to think about this is if we damage any of them or their habitat, they will also take longer to recover. So down the bottom is loads of bacteria and fungi and different cell and um, chains of cells and with those organisms if we lose some bacteria there might be another bacteria that will do the same function but this isn't the case with a lot of the larger organisms. So let's put some names to them. We generally have four groups the microflora, microfauna, mesofauna and macrofauna so small to big. And in the microflora, that's where we've got all the microbes, so the bacteria and fungi. And you need a, a microscope or even an electron microscope to see these organisms. But they have some really important functions. So some of those functions are organic matter turnover, nutrient mineralization from that organic matter. They're really important in aggregate formation. And they're really important that as they can either cause disease or they can suppress disease. If we go to the size, now we've got the protozoa and the nematodes. So these are things that are more, more mobile through the nutrient cycling, but we still need a microscope to see them. And then we've got the and mites. So the biggest columbula or spring tails, you can see them with the naked eye and with the mites. And some of their important functions are um, that they can create pores in soil, they can fragment plant residues, they're important for predating on the smaller organism. So that's where they get their food source. And then we have the much bigger organisms that we can see. So from two millimetres to two metres, if you're a giant Gippsland worm, so it's and they're really important in physical structure of soil. So they'll fragment plant residues, they'll distribute organic matter through the soil pile, and they're 
our aggregate formation, so earthworm casts, for example, really, really help soil structure by binding particles together. And we can see these either with the magnifying glass or directly with our eyes. So giving names to some of these groups, we have the ecosystem engineers. These are all our bigger organisms and they'll alter the physical structure of soil and influence the rates of energy and nutrient movement. So if we think of earthworms, they through the soil profile. That's important in physical structure, so it helps aeration and water movement, so we get better drainage, and then roots have a pathway to move as well through the soil, and then they can take organic matter down through the profile. And then we have the transform fauna. Helen, and so you can see the pictures of them here and the springtails build that. Yes. Can you um yep. you're very you're very cracky at the moment. Um so we might see if we can share via my um my screen your presentation and see where that improves the, the, the cracking. So is there, uh, Helen, you can see see that screen now? Yeah, I can. Yep. You just have to tell me when to wind through. We'll see if the buffering um, improves. Okay, so go to the next one. Yeah, my NBN is a bit dodgy tonight. Is that the one we want to be on? Yeah, and if yep. everyone can let us know through the chat whether that's improved my sound, that I'm not sharing video and sound, that will be really helpful. It is a lot better, Helen. Excellent. Yep. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Yep. So we went through the ecosystem engineers, and now we're on to the litter transformers. And so these guys are really important because they take all that organic matter and shred it up into smaller parts. So they make a bigger surface area of the organic matter, which will be available to the microbes to further the decomposition. So moving on to the next one, Jason. So then we've got the micro food web. So these are all the tiny guys. So the bacteria and the fungi have those really important roles of decomposing the plant litter. But then we have the protozoa and the amoeba and all the nematodes, and they will eat the other organisms. Not sure what's happening now. See your screen, Jason. There was a couple of comments on the uh, chat about um, getting getting the presentation looking right. So I think he might have tried to fix that. Or maybe he's maybe. switching to the PowerPoint instead of the PDF. Maybe. Anyway, the next part of the story is the soil. Oh, food. So we've kind of gone. Yeah. We can Hello. hear you, Jason. Have you I'm got back. Some okay. I'm sorry. I'll just get it all back up again. Right. There. Yeah. Excellent. So if we can get that soil food web. Yep. Get that up. Yep. So this is the way that we can put together all the organisms. And so we have the plants are the first part of the soil food web that they're um, producing organic matter as they grow, as they die through their roots. And then as animals graze them, we have the manure and waste from the animals as well. And then the bacteria, fungi and nematodes feed on that. So that's our second trophic level with energy and carbon transfer going on. 
And then we've got our third trophic level where the protozoa and nematodes and earthworms and arthropods feed on those bacteria and fungi and nematodes. And then you have nematodes that eat nematodes and arthropods that eat arthropods. And then we go up to the high level and you have the animals and birds that eat all of those um, larger insects and things. So they're all interrelated is the really important thing to, to think about there. So going on to the next slide, Jason. Just, uh, just bear with me one second, Helen, while I make sure that everything's recorded there. And yep, it's still recording. That's great. Um, yep. Yep. So Continue now we've if... looked at all the organisms that are in our soil. We've thought about what their functions are and how they're all interconnected. And now we want to think about them in the context of the soil itself. So if we imagine we're in the soil in a 3D space, but we're only in the very top half a centimetre. This is how the smaller organisms in our soil. So you can see here, we've got all these orange patches in the soil. That's where the nematodes live. So they're much larger and they need a much bigger pore space. And then we have all these purple filled in pore spaces. They're the ones that bacteria will live in. So you can see some of them are really large and some of them are tiny. There are loads of tiny purple dots. And so these pores might be full of water when it rains, but as the water drains through the profile, the bacteria will still line the edges of the pores. So there's a lot of them in there because they occupy small spaces. And then the protozoa occupy a pore space between that of the nematodes and the bacteria, so 5 to 20 microns, which is a tiny space. And then fungi are completely different again in that they have no pore size restriction. So they can move in and around and between all the pore um, sizes and the soil particles because they're um, like strings of cells, like um, pieces of string, and they can move between everything. Next slide. So within the soil, we have some hotspots where you'll have microbes in really big numbers. So within our soil, one of those hotspots is organic matter that's decomposing. So in that slide on the top left, you can see loads of bacterial cells that are releasing enzymes to break down organic matter. And in the one directly below it, you've got high full strings that are also releasing enzymes to break down the organic matter. And then in the middle there, we've got that slide where you've got the bright yellow dots that are just screaming out of the picture. So those are bacteria that have been um, dyed with a fluorescence, and they're all sitting in the soil right on the surface of the roots. This is a particular niche of the soil where you're specialised to eating all the exudates that leak out of the roots. And you have a lot of fungi as well as bacteria there. And then next we have soil macroaggregates. So these have a lot of fungi around them that act like ropes to tie the soil particles together. But then also um, bacteria can stick soil particles together with glue. So they're really important in this function as well. So going on to next slide. This is just another kind of close-up of the roots, a schematic diagram that shows you at the very, very tip of the root, we have loads of bacteria and different organisms that are feeding off the exudates there and any dying root cells that are sloughed off as the root grows. And then we also have the AMF. So that's the Arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi. And they're um, quite special in that they have a symbiotic relationship and they grow into the plant root cells and they get their nutrients from the plant, but they help the plant by accessing phosphorus from the soil. So going on to the functions, the next slide. If we just sum them all up, the functions that soil biology do as a group are decomposed plant residues, 
regulate plant nutrient supply. So they do transformation of nitrogen um, elements and then also other nutrients. They improve soil structure. They degrade pesticides and herbicides. So some microbes see that as food source. They regulate water quality so they can reduce nitrogen from runoff because they can eat that. They capture and release greenhouse gases. So just like us, a lot of microbes breathe out CO2, but some also release methane and nitrous oxide. And then they can also suppress soil-borne diseases. So they can compete with soil-borne diseases and either parasitize them or make antibiotics. That's so next one. So we know all about soil biology now and what it does, and we want to do a test. So what do we want to find out about our soil biology and why in a test? Are we interested in the abundance of different biota or in their potential activity? But most importantly, how would this test help us make management decisions? And so Beck kind of covered, you're going to do a soil test, you may be interested in your pH. When you get that test back, you can look at the result you've got and you can decide, do I need to lime or not? With soil biology, because we have so many different types of biology and different functions, it's sometimes not so easy to directly relate it to management compared to soil chemicals. So, what are the things we need to consider when we do the test? Next slide. So do we want test information that's general or specific? And what are going to be the limitations of that test? How many samples are needed? So I've had people come up to me at talks and go, I got some uh, biology tests done, can you tell me what they mean? And because it was expensive, they only got one sample tested. And in that case, you have nothing to compare it to. So you definitely need more than one sample. And then this moves on to the next issue. Will someone help you interpret the results? So Beck's trying to teach us how to do a soils test and then we'll be able to learn how to interpret that in the next session that happens. With soil biology, a lot of advisors and agronomists and even soil chemists don't have a very good knowledge of soil biology. So they often can't help you interpret the test. So in this case, any test that you get done, you wanna make sure the laboratory is going to be able to provide some sort of interpretation or you pick a test where you can interpret it. And then are there any target ranges for healthy and unhealthy soil? So similarly for pH, we know what are the best ranges for pH for our soil for production of some crops and pastures. For some of the biology tests, we haven't worked out yet what are the best ranges. So you might get back a result, but not really know what to do with it because for the test, there are no target ranges yet. This is something that's still in development. So let's go through what some of the test examples are. So moving on to the next one, Jason. So the first thing that you can do is a visual assessment of soil on your own farm. So this will cost you nothing except time. So one way to do it is to look at the ground cover Another way is to look at those meso and macro fauna, the things that we can observe with our own eyes. And then another way is to look at the depth of topsoil and if you have any healthy or damaged roots. So you might have an area of the paddock where things don't look too healthy. And so you can dig it up and actually visually inspect the roots to see if we have a problem where soil biology, particularly pests or pathogens are a constraint. The next way is that you can get some tests done at accredited commercial labs, but there are no accredited commercial labs for biology tests. 
So Beck recommended that you use a lab that has ASPAC or NADA. I'm not sure of any soil biology labs that are accredited in that way. So what I'm suggesting here is that we can use accredited commercial labs for soil chemistry tests that can inform biology. So then if we want to really specialise test, if we're already doing soil chem testing, we read up about biology, we're really interested in it, then this is some of the examples that we can use. So CO2 respiration is a really low resolution test, but it shouldn't be too expensive. We have microbial biomass, which is the weight of the microbes in the soil. And then we have enzyme assays, so cellulose, you might measure the, that enzyme, which is really important for decomposition of organic matter. Then we have the specialised groups, so the mycorrhiza or the nematodes. We have DNA tests that will measure um, total bacteria or total fungi or uh, um, soil microbiome. And then we have the soil-borne pathogen test, so the predictive E test. So moving on, so this soil health guide is one produced by the North Central CMA and it's fantastic. And so it has a bunch of um, tests that you can use for your biology, physical structure and chemical structure. And the biology measures are pretty neat. So the first one is ground cover and you can see in the top right there, there's a bunch of different scenarios for how stubble is treated and then some ratings. So whether there's 20%, 50% or 80% ground cover. Why is ground cover important for soil biology? The answer is that two of the biggest regulators of soil biology are water and temperature. So if you have some coverage on the ground, whether it's crops or um, uh, stubble that will help keep water in, so stopping it drying out, and then it can also um, buffer the temperature. And then the other way is to do biological inspections and root inspections. So in the bottom right, we have the um, root inspections there where um, roots have been dug up for plants that have really bad vigour and gently washed and you can see those root systems are really terrible because they're attacked rhizoctonia. So on to the next one. So evidence of soil biological activity. So this is a test from that North Central CMA book and you basically um, dig up a 20 centimetre square, so 20 by 20 on the side and 10 centimetre deep, and you pull the soil apart and you look to see how many different organisms you have and then how many of each kind there is. So in that picture on the top right, we can see an earthworm, we can see some white fluffy structures, which are mycelium on the stubble that's in there, and then we've got some um, animals in the bottom picture. So this is something really easy to do and this is the right time of year to do it as well as the soil is starting to warm up as we go into spring and while there's a lot of moisture in the soil. So moving on to the next one. So accredited lab tests and by this I mean NADA or ASPAC. So I can see there's some comments in the chat about different labs being accredited for soil biology. They might say they're accredited, but they're probably not NADA or ASPAC accredited. So if you're NADA accredited, it's a really high standard. If you're ASPAC accredited, mostly they have their methods published and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, one thing you can do is use your soil chemical measures as an indirect measure of soil biology. So if you already do this testing, you can look at the results you already have. For example, for soil carbon, I've got two soils where we have a poor one and a good one. 
and their um, calcareous sandy grey loams. And what we've done is take um, measures of the soil chemistry down the profile. And you can see for the poor soil that the organic carbon is quite low and it drops down the profile. But for the good soil, it's quite um, consistent down the profile and practically double. So why organic carbon as an indirect measure of soil biology? One, it's the food source of soil biology. And then soil biology is actually a component of that organic carbon. So that's a really good measure. And you can also use that to benchmark how your paddock's going, and then you can monitor it over time as well. So going on to the next one. So this is the exact same paddock. And we took the other half of the soil sample, so half of it went to the chem lab. The other half went to a commercial lab that does soil biology tests. And you can see here that we've had a um, one of their particular test packages done because we've got a, quite a few different tests here. So microbial activity, microbe groups, useful indicators, and then nitrogen. And so they're in our poor growth and good growth paddocks. So the microbial activity is the CO2 respiration. How much CO2 do these microbes breathe out? And we can see that for the good paddock, it's double the bad paddock, which is similar to our organic carbon measure. And then similarly for the soil microbial biomass, that is similarly double for the poor growth and the good growth. So the good one is double the poor one. And then we have some other measures here. So we have the total microorganisms. We have the mycorrhiza. So they're the ones that are colonizing in the roots and then have their hyphae go out into the soil. That one, there's quite a large difference between the poor and the good growth. Then we have the microbial diversity and the fungal and bacterial ratio. And then we have a bunch of nitrogen measures. And for me, the big difference here between the accredited lab and the commercial biology labs is that if I want to look up how the test was done for the chemistry labs, I can generally go to their website and see the exact test. And then I can go to a different chemistry lab and see if they use the same test. And I know that every time I send a sample there, it will be measured the same way. But for these commercial labor laboratories for biology, that's part of their proprietary information and it's part of their competitive edge. So I'm a soil biologist and I can look at some of this data, but I don't know how they did the test. So the microbial diversity one, I don't know how they worked it out. I've been to this lab's website right? and there's no information. So. Some of these tests I think are good, but some of them I'm not sure because I don't know how they worked it out. And then the other thing is that when I saw these test results, I thought, okay, um, the microbial biomass carbon is twice as good in the good paddock. Why would that be? So then I went back to the soil chemistry data and use that to support an interpretation of why the good paddock had double the biology. And it was because the good paddock had a better pH, more organic carbon, which is the food, better bulk density, so you're gonna have less compaction and better cation exchange capacity. So um, yeah, sometimes you can do these biology tests, but knowing a bit about the performance of the paddock or what treatment you've done to it will help the interpretation. So going on to the next slide. If you get your soil biology test back, you need to know um, what does the number mean that's on the test. So in this case, they've used the Speedo system but they've also used the traffic light system. And so the thing I want to point out here is they have microbial activity indicator. Yours is 
8.6. And the guide for a good soil is 80. So where does that 80 number come from? Does it account for a soil that's really high in sand versus a soil that's really high in clay? Because maybe I've got a calcareous soil. So is that number appropriate for my soil? Is it appropriate for my climate? Is it appropriate for my cereal system or my dairy soil or for my macadamia orchard? And then what depth is that for? Because I might have done sampling from 0 to 10, but also 10 to 20. So these are things where for a lot of soil chemistry measures, these um, guides are well known. But for biology, this lab is trying to help. But if this is the same measure that everybody gets, then how do I know that it's appropriate for my soil? So going on to the next slide. Some of the other tests that are offered are um, this one here, where we have the list of things that are measured in soil. So active bacteria, total bacteria, active fungi. And what that lab does is they do a microscopic inspection. So they'll count the number of bacteria, fungi and protozoa. They might inspect the roots to see um, how, what percentage are colonised or they'll look at nematode diversity by assessing the mouth parts, which you can see in the bottom right, because um, uh, nematodes that eat bacteria have different mouth parts to those that eat fungi, those that attack plant roots, and those that eat other nematodes. So if you've got a diversity of these nematodes and you've actually got a really healthy soil, because that's that soil food web functioning, other labs will take your soil and put it in a solution and then culture it on agar plates and then count what grows. And you know, this is okay, but from you know, recent work in soil biology and moving to DNA technology, we know that 95% of the microbes in soil don't actually grow on agar plates. So this is a really restricted view of what's actually living in your soil. So moving to the next one, um, DNA testing for soil. In this case, I'm really thinking about constraints and in cropping systems. So if you have um, soils where you can see the crop is performing really badly, um, this is one way to do a soil biology test to measure it and determine what's happening. So the predictor B test is done by SARDI and it covers a range of cereal pests and pathogens. And the best thing about this particular test, while it might not be really helpful for pastures, it shows you that for really good soil biology tests, they're quantitative, so they have a direct measurement, they're specifics, and this one actually does multiple pathogens. But also this DNA test is calibrated to the levels of disease that occur in the field. And it can directly inform your management because you can see that if in your particular, so example in Victoria in the Northwest, you have a high risk of getting rhizoctonia according to the DNA test, then you think you might think, okay, I won't go wheat on wheat. I'm going to go early into my canola phase. So this is a really good test and it's good because it's been refined over a long time. And it's also directly related to the field and management. So moving on to the next one. So population analysis tests. Some of you might have heard of the gut microbiome where you can get your own sequence by taking a fecal sample and you send it to the laboratory and they tell you all the microbes that live in your gut. You can do the exact same thing with soil. So there's labs in Australia now where you can send them your soil sample, they'll extract the DNA and then they'll do sequencing 
and tell you all the microbes that are in that sample. So here we have a diagram with five um, soils from different locations in WA. And if you look at the pie chart, these are the um, different groups of bacteria and fungi that are in that soil. And you can see just looking at the yellow one, which is called bacteria group one, that that yellow portion changes across the five soils. But what does that mean for management? You have more of one group than the other. You know, I find that really hard to, um, to think about, especially when we think about that that's just at a really high level. So this particular test is great for research because that bacteria one, I would go and do statistics and drill down further and find out what are actually all the groups that are contributing to that difference. And then I'll look at the soil chemistry and see how they relate to that or see what their function is. Are they involved in nitrogen cycling or herbicide degradation? But just having these pie charts, what, what can you do with that with management? It's, it's pretty tricky. It's really high level information. And the graph on the right, you can see this is um, how each dot is one soil sample that's been sequenced. And the closer together dots are, the more related they are. So if you have two samples from your farm, they're going to be pretty highly related. And so you really need to see them in the context of other samples from different areas or different soil types, or maybe if you have one field with a pasture and one with the cereal. But even then, how do you turn that into something informative for management? So going on to the next one. So um, this is another good example of soil biology testing. So the soilquality.org.au website has soil tests for biology, physics and chemistry. And the really important thing here is that they're benchmarked. So they have the traffic light system and they're benchmarked for your soil type and your rainfall across the whole country. It's mostly for cropping and mixed grazing. But this website has some great fact sheets, which might be helpful if people want to go and spend money on soil biology tests. And on the right here, we can see this is um, soil biology testing for microbial biomass carbon, which is probably the main soil biology test that they use in soilquality.org. And it's a pretty reliable test. I really like this one. And so we have the traffic light system across the bottom. And you can see that 40% of the farms in the Grampians that were tested are at the higher end of the microbial biomass scale. And then a small number are at the low end. But this is a good reliable test. So um, if you wanted to start somewhere, I would probably recommend this one because we do have ranges for this test. Okay, so moving on. So you're still keen to test soil biology? What next? So I would say I try doing on farm systems. Digging it up and and then um, re-examine your soil biology tests. So if you've done some recently, have a look at your organic carbon as an indirect indicator and think about the paddocks that you use in those tests and how they perform. And then if you want to do a soil biology test, do what I do and it will cost you more, but it will be more informative. Split the sample half to the chem lab, half to the biology lab. Next slide. So what if you just don't want to do a test, but you're still really interested in soil biology? 
The first thing that you can do is address your soil chemical and physical constraints. So if you remember right back to the part of the first part of the biology, I talked about um, where the biota live in the different pore sizes. So if you have compaction issues, then if you can address this, you're making a better soil for the biology to live in. Similarly, if you have acidity or lots of other constraints, if you can address those, then you'll naturally increase your biology by having a better soil. But the thing to remember is that this takes time and you might need to plan it. And Another thing you can do is monitor or increase your soil organic matter because that's the food for the biology, but it will also at the same time help your soil structure and your water retention and your nutrient retention. So that's a win all around. Um, you can maintain ground cover, so retain stubble or use perennial pasture sometime. You can uh, increase your plant diversity because having different root systems gives different biology because of the different exudates and different root systems will break down at different rates. Uh, you can be conscious of your application rates of fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides because these have different effects on the soil biology and you can be conscious of um, reducing compaction by not overstocking. The next slide. So in summary, um, soil biology is a community of organisms. So sometimes it's difficult to measure one lot of organisms and convert that to a manage or to do DNA sequencing and look at all of them at once in their infinite glory and high level detail and convert that to management action. So you need to have a think about, you know, what, what you are your tests to do. Exceptions to soil borne pathogens and pests, big options for ameliorating that constraint, whether it's rotation or cultivar selection or fungicides. Um, so what biology tests do you choose depends on what you want to know. And then to consider how easy are the results to use. So maybe you just want a baseline, you're interested in it, so go do a measurement and see what you get for your good paddock and your bad paddock, or where you've lined and not lined, and then monitor it or um, ask questions of the lab. Is interpretation included in the test or not? Some labs charge an astronomical amount for interpretation. Um, how many samples do you need and what's the best time? So I recommend doing it in spring after rain because that will stimulate the biological community. Uh, but also beware testing services that want to sell you a product to fix what you've just measured in your soil. So I did a search of some of the labs that are currently doing products and was a little bit disappointed that um, products and tests can be so interlinked with some. So just have a think about that. Uh, and that's everything, Jason. Thank you, Helen. Um, I will um, ask everyone, I've collected all the questions as uh, as it, we've gone through, um, and I'll be um, going through them in one second. But just so while uh, Helen just has a break, I'll just talk about what's coming up. So we're in this series, we've got two more Tuesday nights. Uh, next week is focused on soil carbon. Uh, and then the following week, uh, we've got Professor Armstrong talking about grain yields with organic matter. Um, so that that uh, that's the next two weeks. Then we have a week off and then uh, part of the Healthy Landscapes or Healthy Livestock Project run by the Macedon Rangers Shire Council. We've got the local farmers journey in holistic farming. So we've got uh, a couple of farmers on 
each one farmer on September the 8th, uh, Sam White at Sedonia uh, Beef. Uh, Tuesday the 15th, we have Patrick Francis of Moffat Farm. And then on Tuesday the 22nd, we have two uh, farmers that have recently done our grazing course. Um, we'll talk about their, their transformation. You can look all these up at our on our website. Uh, just type in um, mrscvic.vic.gov.au sustainable farming. And as Rebecca has talked about, we've got our understanding your soil tests coming up in late October, early November, when Beck has a chance to go away on holidays or not. Um, for those of you who are, who are residents of the Macedon Raisin Shire or the Upper Colburn Catchment, you have um, the ability to access my services as a free one-to-one -one practical support on your property to talk about grazing management and, as I mentioned, the Regenerative Grazing Short Course for this year starts on October 5th and we've adapted that to be partly online and partly in the paddock. Um, but if you are interested, this is um, really um, subsidised, this course. So uh, it's a great opportunity for you to, to learn some information about grazing if you have some livestock on your property. Um, so here are some of the questions. Um, Beck and uh, and Helen, so I just go and make sure that uh, I have Beck unmuted to answer some of these. Beck, I'll just get you to. But the first one, I suppose, I'll go to you, Helen. Was um, the question that was in posed in that first one that Beck had sort of handballed over to you? Is there a relationship between soil chemistry and weeds? Um, I don't know much about weeds. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. Beck, are there any special? Um, are there any that are specialised for certified again? So the labs. I assume that's what Anthony is talking about there. Uh, so I guess. Uh, if it's in regards to uh, certification for testing organics, um, the any lab that's doing any soil tests, the testing will be the same for an organic um, property opposed to a non-organic property because the tests are the same. If it's in regards to like getting a soil test to get a certification to prove that you are organic, um, I'm not 100% sure. If, if yeah, I don't. I'm not really aware if there is any or what the processes are for that. So uh, if you have any more um, details about that specific question, Anthony, then feel free to send that through to Jason or myself and I can tease it out. But um, hopefully something in there answered something for you. Okay, Helen, I, I see that you answered this one through the, the chat for those that aren't accessing the chat. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, just as there are bacteria that um, consume methane, uh, that produce m methane, there's also archaea and bacteria that eat methane as food source. So most of the generators are things that live in paddies or um, uh, soils that are um, anaerobic or waterlogged. I think that's either Helen or or um, Beck. You're obviously typing away, and we can hear nice. you. So the next one, um, Agpath is an accredited soil biology testing lab. Hugh um, also microwise in South Australia, I believe, by Dean. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, there? I just. I can't see any evidence of accreditation on the website. So, yep. but anyway, it's not for me as a big government employee to um, say who's better than anyone else. But 
um, there is a level of re reliability that comes with accreditation. So, and micro-wise, that particular lab, which is actually micro, what is it, Microbiology Labs Australia, um, yeah, they, they're quite a good lab, but um, if I go to a soil chem lab, I can see the exact test, and while I um, know that some of the micro-wise stuff is based on scientific publications, when I publish a scientific paper, I have to put the method there so that anyone who wants to repeat my research can do the exact same thing. And this is not the case with some of the biology labs because they're trying to protect their IP. So. Okay. The next um, next question. Uh, hi, Helen. If, if there is a need for color to make meaningful result, who funds or coordinates that research from Brad? So, um, Soil CRC is actually really interested in this and um, there was a project on it that got funded but didn't go ahead unfortunately, which was going to tackle some of this kind of issue of looking at um, getting uh, ranges for high and low performing soils. So it's still something that needs to be done. And so it will either eventually happen through the soil CRC or through a um, R&D that's very interested in soil biology. So the, the hardest part of doing that is probably what tests to choose because you need to choose something that can be done by a commercial laboratory so that it's useful for farmers. And then there's the issue of um, if you're going to put ranges on these things, they need to be for um, particular soil types and also climate. And then probably the extra layer of management or cropping or you know agricultural system. Because these three things are going to determine what biology is in the soil. Move on to the next question. Helen, what would uh, some of these biologic tests help us understand if they are managing their fertility and carbon in a good way? Yeah, I would say that they would, Gary. I'd say that if if you're already doing the chem test and you've got a good handle on that, then do the biology test to see um, if when you increase your soil fertility, you're increasing your biological activity or the amount of biology in the soil. So, but yeah, you really don't want to be moving into biology testing, I think, unless you've got a really good handle on, on all the other stuff, addressing constraints and, um, and even understanding your soil chem test. So the same, just moving down, for example, if a farmer wanted to improve poor soil by managing the soil carbon, would there be a benefit in soil biology test as against the soil carbon test? I would say do both. And which Because the soil biology is not going to increase um, unless the carbon does. And which labs test for microbiology, biomass, carbons, and nitrogen? The SVP in WA used to do it, and then they decided that it was too labor intensive, which is why a lot of chemistry labs don't do biology tests, because that's one chemistry lab that used to do one. Um, I do know a lab in South Australia that does do that test, so Microbiology Labs Australia do it. And I'm just going back up to see if there was a couple of more um, questions there. Why cropland soil carbon could improve without fertilizer in a dry land? The soil biology, or the, or is there another reason? Okay, so I'm not saying don't use fertilizer. I'm saying just go easy on the fertilizer. Because a classic example there is um, mycorrhiza, 
that if you have too much phosphorus, then the mycorrhiza don't work as hard to get phosphorus for the plant. And similarly, if you have too much nitrogen in the soil and you've got a legume and you've gone to the trouble of inoculating it, then the, the rhizobium won't be as so um, active in, in fixing nitrogen if there's a lot already in the soil. So sometimes we don't need a lot, but if we do use the fertilizer and we get really good plant growth, that's also great for the microbes because then you'll have a lot of um, a lot more root material and a lot more exudates, but also there are microbes that eat nitrate and ammonium. So it's a balance. Okay, that's all I can see there at the moment. So um, what I'm going to do is just unmute uh, you all, hopefully, and if you can unmute yourselves at the top as well. Um, you can show your appreciation to uh, Rebecca and Helen in the usual way. So um, thanks guys, that was terrific. Well done and stop.